that's occupying a whole lot of my oh yeah time. yeah are we all on? i think we're waiting for donna who's connecting oh, her computer <laughs> she's going to give us a sign okay good let's start um um so we do have a quorum and uh, i'd like to call this meeting to order i want to welcome all of you who are here this evening and um welcome all the 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 board members and all the folks college people and even non-college folks that are here i um i want to i want to start with a with a, a quote that I, I remember reading at the unitarian church that that um freedom of the mind is the is the beginning of all of the freedoms all right and so uh, we'd like to um adopt the agenda but i think we have uh a change is that correct kathy correct all right so i um i move uh, i make a motion to adopt the agenda with the following changes which would be moving from tab f letter i the rfp for legal services up to um, tab e for action items that's the rfp for legal services so everybody can track that and then moving uh, under tab e uh, item f the approval of the resolution uh, up to the top to a okay okay so we have a we have one a more motion. Yeah, one, more. <laughs> one more i have one more change oh, one sorry. more change um so for the uh approval of board goals which is j. j under tab f that we would also move that up to tab e and make it an action item okay all right so um uh the motion is uh, to move uh, the approval of resolution to the beginning up to tab A and to move under tab F, I, and J into action items under tab E, correct? correct. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We didn't have any discussion. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, approved. And so let's, let's move on and we'll start with... Um, approval of resolution uh, is that correct i think it is that'll be under under tab a and we'll start with that right away before we do the president's report we'll do this mm -hmm. and so tina linda you and i will be doing this you're probably a better reader than i am so you, probably do you want me to read this <laughs> yes the whole thing with gusto. Yeah. Am I ready to read? Yeah. Okay. This is a resolution of the Santa Community College Governing Board to award a distinguished service medallion to Dr. Tina Levesky Taylor. Whereas Dr. Levesky Taylor has been a part of the Santa Fe Community College's history, joining the institution in the first year to develop programs. And whereas Dr. Levesky Taylor was instrumental in the early development of the nursing program, touching every aspect of the curriculum, faculty, and treatment as a student services. And whereas Dr. Levesky Taylor was key to the site selection for the permanent campus and also located various sites around town where SFCC could operate programs, thus allowing the college to spread its impact to a broad population. And whereas Dr. Levesky Taylor became the division head for business and developed the original proposal to establish Small Business Development Center Network, and whereas Dr. Levesky Taylor left SFCC to expand her knowledge and ability as an administrator, taking a position with the University of Mexico in the Ramos branch, then traveling to California to serve in many positions for Sierra Community College District, and whereas Dr. Levesky Taylor further expanded her career in Colorado, serving as Vice President for the Boulder County Campus of Front Range Community College, and whereas Dr. Levesky Taylor returned to SFCC in 2008 to take on special 
Or if you could stand on the edge, you okay. could probably talk to, we could probably hear you. You can use that mic if you want. <laughs> I can use my uh, classroom voice and yes. then I, I won't. <laughs> well, and, and actually, I would like to yes, stand yes. here because yes. I would like to look see at your face. you and the audience. But as a founding staff member of SFCC, I really, really appreciate um, receiving this award during the 30th anniversary of the college. And uh, coincident coincidentally, it is almost exactly 30 years um, since we first started offering classes um, in the fall of 1983 at various locations um, in the community. And we began, uh, I'm, this, okay. <laughs> but then I can't see these places. I'll stand right here. And we, we began operating in the old Eberline um, Instruments building um, in the in Valdez Industrial Park, uh, which and the location was like right behind where Coles is these days. And some of my fondest memories, and, and Chris was there in the beginning too, some of my fondest memories of, of uh, that facility are um, we used to have faculty and staff meetings by literally rolling our chairs into the center of this big bull ring. And we could do that then because there weren't very many of us and we were all housed together in, and we had jerry-rigged workstations in this big open space. So it worked really, really well. And we also thought this was a huge improvement over the um, elementary school wing of the School for the Deaf which is where we were um, over the summer before we actually opened the college. And that was a real trip. Um, we got to do our interviews of prospective faculty and staff in little people's uh, <laughs> tables and chairs. And uh, that, you know, added a lot of levity to the situation in addition to the fact that we were actually sitting all of us, the interviewers and interviewees with our knees in our faces. It was kind of hard to have dignity in that kind of <laughs> situation, but we made it work. And I, I actually have to take the opportunity to clarify something with Chair Abeta. In spite of what you remember, you know, might remember, I actually started working at SFCC before you did. You did. By, I know. by a few months. But we worked together for a really long time. And actually what happened um, is the voters passed the operating mill levy for the college in March of 1983. The president, the founding president, was hired in April of 1983. Um, the deans were hired in May. And I was actually hired at the end of May 
um, on a 30-day consulting contract, and I ended up staying for eight and a half years and working <laughs> in every functional area of the college. And that's where I first met board member Siegel. Um, she was actually interested in having a, a home health care um, degree program, training program developed by the college. And um, she was amazed that when she approached me and Randy Grissom, we immediately said, yes, let's do it. Let's move forward. Um, and on a more serious note, as I'm being recognized this evening, I want to take the opportunity to acknowledge the contributions of two very important people uh, who, um, I'm going to have to put my glasses on, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> I want to acknowledge two individuals who spearheaded the enormous effort to attain legislative and voter approval to establish SFCC and get it up and running. And you actually heard about this from uh, Dr. Jim Miller Sr. at the um, convocation at the beginning of this semester. It was fairly amazing obstacles and hoops that had to be gone through. And Jim Miller you could tell, I mean, he's 80-something years old, and he's got incredible energy and spirit, and he's the same guy. I, I see him standing up there going out and telling the voters to, to vote to support um, and create a local community college. He worked with, the Santa Fe, with Santa Fe's legislative delegation and community leaders and led the charge to give Santa Fe residents their community college. Bill Witter, SFCC's founding president, was a visionary and inexhaustible leader. Any of you who knew him, he was, I would say he was hyperactive. He was, he was that um, energetic. And, uh, but he also, he had the wisdom to declare student success as the college's primary goal from day one. And that was several decades before it became a national trend. It was even printed on the back of our business cards initially, but that was from day one, student success. It was an honor working with them both. And Nancy Witter Wilkinson, who is um, Bill Witter's widow, is actually serving on the SFCC Foundation Board um, at this time. And I also, I want to um, acknowledge something very special that Nancy did. Um, uh, she recently made a $500 donation to the foundation to honor my service to Santa Fe Community College and my leadership in establishing the Higher Education Center. Uh. So at the time when I was here the first time around, I thought that being a founding SFCC staff member was a once in a lifetime died and go to heaven experience. Amazingly enough, and primarily based on my experience here at SFCC, I had the good fortune to be hired as the founding administrator of a brand new community college campus in Northern California, and that was the Sierra College Nevada County campus in Grass Valley. Um, I was hired a year before that campus opened to oversee final stages of construction and um, put together a staffing plan and, and uh, get operating funding. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Martha Romero was there in California during those years, and it was during a recession. It, it was tough finding operating money, but somehow it happened. And after 11 years and um, uh, getting a bond measure approved to build out the campus, I left to go to Colorado, and um, when my husband and I, and my husband Alan is right here, who's, and he's been with me all along, supporting me throughout the years, and he was like a, um, an associate founding staff member at SFCC. <laughs> but um, when we made the move to California, we always knew we were coming back home to Santa Fe, because this is where our hearts are. So when I had the opportunity to come home to SFCC five years ago and work with President Ortego, it was another incredible event. And yes, the rumors about Sheila are true. She did start as a secretary at SFCC. <laughs> and in fact, for a while, she was my secretary and Randy Grissom's secretary. Um, and she made it up 
through the ranks, moved you know, from staff member uh, and, and became uh, manager and administrator, and then ultimately um, our recently passed president of Santa Fe Community College. And Sheila um, had the vision and intestinal fortitude to take on the powers that be and establish the Higher Education Center. And I will be forever grateful to her for giving me the opportunity to end my career in working to create the HEC. So finally, after 400 years, Santa Fe has affordable access to public bachelor's completion and graduate programs right here in the community so people don't have to leave or, or commute or whatever. But this baby isn't fully birthed yet. We need to build and move into that new building so that we can expand the programs and broaden the access to the bachelor's completion and graduate programs. So, although I'm retiring effective October 1st, you're not getting rid of me just yet. I plan, uh, as long as Dr. Guzman continues to uh, approve, um, uh, I will work on a quarter-time contract to continue to uh, ensure the smooth transi transition of the HEC and make damn sure that we actually build that building and move in for the spring of 2015. I'm not going away until that happens. I have a commitment to, to Santa Fe Community College, the folks in the audience, and the community to make sure that the, the dream of the Higher Education Center is realized. But thank you very much. And I also um, want to thank the board for putting me first on the agenda, because now Alan and I are going to Geronimo's and having one hell of a celebration. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Thanks, Tina. Enjoy your dinner. Oh, we will. <laughs> um, now we'll move on to the president's report. Dr. Guzman. Thank you. Well, it has been a, a great summer where uh, we have been able to finish our um, reorganization in the instructional uh, areas. Uh, we met and chose, uh, Randy Grissom and I interviewed all of the deans uh, and, and chose three. And we interviewed all of the uh, chairs and chose the chairs and the lead faculty. And so the instructional area is in place. Um, we have, uh, with, the, with the changes that we have made, we have saved in the instructional area about a million dollars. Uh, we have lowered the number of um, secretaries. Now secretaries are sitting in the outside instead of in their own offices. And they are getting to deal with students, which is a very good thing for the secretaries of the departments to do. Uh, we have, uh, in looking at our uh, enrollment, uh, I believe, and we agreed with uh, the instructional in, in the councils that we had, that we have an underrepresentation of Native American students and that Native American students should be one of our priorities in recruitment. And so we have had a coordinator, a coordinator for Native American students approved, and we will be uh, advertising that position, and the the work of that position will be for that person to go to the pueblos, and to work with the pueblos that are in our uh, in our service community to see what they wish from us. We know, you know that we already have classes in the Indian school. Uh, we have CNA classes. Uh, and you know that we have also doubled the number of dual credit students for next year, where last year the students had to come 
to Santa Fe Community College, we are now either going to the schools or we were able to find enough qualified teachers so that uh, the, the classes would take place at the schools. The, the superintendent and the two uh, principals are just uh, very, very happy that, that we have been able to expand the dual credit program. And we want to do the same thing with the uh, Native American students. In one of my meetings uh, with the Tezuque Pueblo, uh, we are going to be working with them. Boris in education will be working with them and we will be the first college to have a, um, a native language as a, as, as a language in the public schools. Years ago, the, the legislature approved for Native Americans a, a certificate that would allow Native Americans to go into the public schools and teach their native language to their students. Um, there, as far as we know, uh, there are no colleges or community colleges that have taken that approval and made it into a certificate. And so Boris is going to be working uh, with the Tezuque Pueblo so that, uh, and with UNM, because UNM has a Native American studies uh, that is very well known, to see how we convert that, le that legislative uh, into a certificate where then the, we would start with the Tezuque Pueblo because it's always good to start with a pilot and, and we would train Native American uh, peoples to teach their language as, a, as, as, as not a second language because it's their first language, but to maintain, it would be a maintenance program so that because what they're afraid of is that their children are losing their language and they don't want their children to lose their language. And if that language isn't utilized at all in the school, then it means that it may not be as important. So we're really excited about the work that we're doing with our, with our Pueblos and with our Native American uh, populations. Uh, we're, we've, we've finished the reorganization in the instructional area and, and now we're beginning to look at the administrative area. Uh, I think that there are uh, places to save in, in the administration area also. And so I will be ready and we'll be talking with you throughout the month on the changes that I think are appropriate to save more money. I think that what we've seen in the, uh, in the restructuring of the instructional area is that while we saved money, uh, we were able to add eight full-time faculty and, and strengthen uh, instruction through those faculty. And so I should be able to come with some, uh, with a draft of what the administration would look like in the administrative area. I have been working with them uh, for two months since Meredith left. And so I have a good feeling. I have been able to hire some very good people, some very strong people. Uh, and so I will be bringing that to you uh, next uh, month. And that is my report. Mr. Chair? Um, uh, when I was working with ABE, one of the things that we, um, that we did was approach the Pueblos, and, and one of the important things that I found out was that each Pueblo really functions within its own world. That's right. And so it's, it's really important not to make it a generic program that's going to, that's going to right. fit with every, yeah. with every Pueblo. It just no, isn't that way, you know? Because, because what it'll be, it will we'll develop a methodology for teaching language, right. but then they will be bringing their own language. Oh, great. And so they, they really are happy that, that uh, we will be doing this with them. And we're starting with Tezuke because they were the ones that knocked at our door. I like Tezuke. I taught GED there and it was a great program. I, I liked it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so now we have uh, the employee of the month. Um, and so, uh, I get Marcia, Martha Sorensen. Robert. 
It'll be Robert Shankin move it, passing it forward. <coughs> So Martha Sorensen is a clinical social worker and she's very proud of her efforts when she was at the University of North Carolina Cancer Center. She developed a uh, family counseling, family and patient counseling program at the Cancer Center there. At Santa Fe Community College, she teaches sociology classes, quite a range of sociology classes, and she teaches Introduction to Sustainability. She is very dedicated to bringing service learning to each and every one of her classes. Um, why I nominated Martha is I got to work nearby Martha for a number of years and just had the pleasure and the privilege of seeing somebody who just went way above and beyond the call of duty for the sake of her students. Um, she was there at very extreme hours. <clears throat> um, when I would talk to her about her teaching, she would say how she excited she was about this certain lesson plan that she was developing. And she's been a great inspiration to me. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> you want to say something, Martha? You can say three words. <laughs> Thank you for this award. I've been here for eight years. Chris, long time, right? Um, and I love working with the students here. Um, we have interesting challenges with our students sometimes because we are an open campus, so we get the full range of students. Um, age-wise, ability-wise, et cetera. But I love seeing the mix develop and interactions among my students in my classes. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Susan Weaver. Um, Susan isn't here, but I have a statement to read uh, okay. from her for uh, Mason. Is Mason here? Is Mason here? Yeah, Mason, come on up. There's Mason. <laughs> um, this is from Susan Weaver to the Governing Board. I hope that you will excuse me for not being present to introduce Mason. On Tuesdays, I work until 5.30 p.m., and then I have a class at 5.30. Therefore, I am unable to attend the meeting. I hope this statement will convey why I nominated Mason to be a WOW recipient. Since I am not the only person in financial aid who appreciates Mason, I am including responses from everyone in our department concerning Mason. Mason always processes our requests with a smile or a laugh, and he never acts like he is inconvenienced with our request requests. He also gives the impression that no job request is too small. He does his job precisely and is meticulous with his work. He does not try to complete the task as quickly as possible just to get the job done, yet he responds quickly to our OIT requests. While he is working on a task, Mason often offers helpful suggestions and solutions that might help our department function more effectively. To summarize, Mason goes out of his way to help us with all of our OIT needs. Everyone in the financial aid office appreciates all the work he has done for us. Thank you for selecting Mason as a WOW recipient. Best regards, Susie Weaver, financial aid coordinator. <laughs> I wish she was here to thank her back. <laughs> it's awesome that you have this available to people just to let them know they've been doing a good job. It's awesome. It's cool. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank nice. you very much. <laughs> Congratulations. You have a good attitude, man. Yes. Way to go. You can just feel it. Yeah. Um, Donna, do we have any public comments? Um, yes. Um, Matt Sherman. Oh, Matt's not here. He must Who's this? Matt. Uh, Matt Sherman. You know Matt. Okay. Maybe he's out in the hall. That's the only person who has signed up. Did you sign in, Stan? Yes. Okay. Um, 
Uh, Donna, I think Stan Rosen signed in then. Might have signed in at the wrong place. First. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Stan, come on up. And I know Stan, but I have to remind you three minutes, Stan. <laughs> All right. I don't come that often, so yeah. maybe you'll give me four. Uh, I have three items that I wanted to bring up. Uh, one is about the traffic problem. Uh, when the bi bicycle factory opens, mm -hmm. and it's a general long-term problem, uh, I think there's going to become uh, a major traffic hazard. Because even now, without the cars coming out, it's very difficult to know sometimes whether a car is going around or whether they're stopping to let you go. And uh, I'm sure you all know that we were very surprised uh, at the homeowners meeting that the uh, uh, proposal to build the housing in back of the college was approved. Uh, they called us in to have input uh, a new system of input at the homeowners group and after they told us all the nice things they wanted to do they unceremoniously told us that they're going to build it and when that happens with 300 apartments it's going to be even worse uh, I myself ride the road two or three times a day and I must say there's always a car on my tail <laughs> now students always wait to, or I don't think, I don't know, they wait till the last minute to get to the class. <laughs> and it's very uncomfortable. And yesterday somebody went around me at the end. Uh, and so uh, uh, I think that this needs attention now and not uh, when all these things come together. And I would like to recommend to the board uh, that they have a public meeting involving the Santa Fe Community College, the, the appropriate personnel, the homeowners groups in uh, Rancho Viejo, the county police department because the county stops and starts but the road is in both the county and the city, and uh, the county traffic department, the manager of the bi bicycle factory, uh, it's not open yet, Paradora and the church, and possibly the other project uh, that's uh, at the stoplight. And I think it should be a continuing committee, and I think it should be, the traffic issue should be taken very seriously because I could see the possibility of accidents, possibly changing the speed limits, uh, education of the people coming out of the plant, and education of the students. The second two points I want to bring up is, over time I have attempted to get the minutes of the uh, uh, board, and uh, they used to be much more readily available. The last time I went, they were in somebody's office. I think it's extremely important for transparency and for citizens who are interested in, in what goes on at the college that I would make two recommendations. One is that the minutes be made available, that the public be notified that the minutes are made available, and that, and that, the, and that the minutes also be at the public library. Because not every, uh, people always say, I'm not gonna go way out to the college. Well, unfortunately I live here. And, uh, uh, so I think it's, it's important, uh, you know, that we, we do that and that people who want to look at the minutes uh, have an opportunity to do it. And I had a third point, but I'm not sure I remember it. But at any rate, uh, I, uh, oh, I, I just wanted to commend the number of people at this meeting. I have been to meetings in the past where there were three people here 
and they were all from the college. <coughs> I think when the, when the board has an issue that's relevant to a particular group in the community, that they should do an active role of getting people from that group here, whether it's something you're going to vote on or whether it's a report or a program. Because I think that one of the questions that uh, I would evaluate if I were evaluating how well the college is doing, and that is how many citizens feel it's important enough to come to this meeting? Right. And the more, the merrier. And thank you. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. Chairman Aveda, uh, I could schedule somebody from the county to come in October if the board is interested in, in having that discussion. Uh, and and uh, we, can add, we can begin advertising it now for all of the Rancho Viejos. Thank you. All right, um, now uh, communications, uh, faculty senate report. Chair. Madam President, members of the board. Um, I think you have before you then the approved minutes for um, August the 15th, which was convocation. And please feel free to ask me any questions that you have. Um, I would point direction toward point number four, uh, effective representation on governance councils. Updates on dates of times of the council meetings are requested. Jack has the list, but it appears some member lists have not been updated. Meeting times need to be accommodating of faculty schedules. We also have that did not make it to you in time. The instead of approved minutes from um, August 30 that did not make it in time for inclusion in this board packet. Those there's an ongoing conversation within faculty senate about the role of the shared governance councils and then within the past meeting this past Friday a discussion um, developed that led faculty then to uh, come to an opinion of a lack of confidence in the shared governance structure um, and those issues as such then and this went out to all faculty today via all faculty on the internal server email on Friday, September the 13th, Faculty Senate entered into a dialogue that culminated in drafting a position statement expressing a lack of confidence in the current SFCC council structure. Motion. Be it resolved that Faculty Senate does not have confidence in the current council system. Faculty Senate cannot support said councils because faculty are not able to participate in a meaningful way. The councils are not an effective method for including faculty input into the decision-making process. So that was the motion and the statement. The reasons Faculty Senate expresses lack of confidence are, council meetings are scheduled during class times when faculty in, is unable to attend. Scheduled council meetings were removed. Faculty members were not able to continue attending. Several faculty members had scheduled their classes around agreed upon meeting times, only discovered the times were changed without input from council faculty membership. Faculty input is consistently a minority opinion in the councils. Councils favor staff and administration participation through a disproportionate membership body. Next point. The proliferation of committees and subcommittees create an increasingly unwieldy input process. It is the opinion of Faculty Senate that the council structure is not effectively representing college constituencies in order to be a considered, in order to be considered a function of the shared governance process as was originally proposed, which is where we went into this. Closing statement. While the current council system has proven to be unwieldy, Faculty Senate acknowledges the potential benefit in collectively dialoguing with peers and colleagues to address systemic issues. It may be worth reviewing the current system to determine how this dynamic itself can be optimized. There are a number of factors that became difficult for faculty to attend to these. Um, and since this was distributed this morning, Dr. Guzman has gracefully then um, scheduled a meeting for us at 2. Um, and I believe that's an opportunity to discuss this. But there is a difference in opinion or type of input from between faculty or staff administration. 
and there's seven, I believe, council structures, and then one of those has eight subcommittees. And that's increasingly becoming a burden of getting people into to discuss what that dialogue needs to be effectively. Um, then, and I personally have experienced this, and this is feedback also from other members of the faculty who have served on these councils, that when you're in the room and you've maybe got two, maybe you've got three, maybe you've got four, maybe you've got one, faculty representative in the room, and there might be eight, nine, 10, 15 staff, administration, vice presidents, all dear trusted friends and colleagues, but there's a difficulty of trying to get an opinion across in that domain. And so, and I per I've personally experienced it where and some advice is given on an issue and then it's taken off into conversation and it's hard to get back to the point that is needed to really justify equal footing in the input process to have it count as a shared governance process. And there was recently distributed then in draft form only a document that purported to eventually include the council structures in policy 1-11 which is a shared governance process. And so for these councils to work in that, a serious re-looking at how they're structured, scheduled, and distributed and maintained needs to be seriously looked at. We are not finding, there are some other issues I'm glad to talk about another time that are on our end um, and we accept responsibility for, um, but having meetings back to back to back on the afternoon of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we can't get to it consistently. And then last, in spring, when we left this process, and staff, or excuse me, faculty then went on summer break, we had appointments lined up. And then when we came back, some committees had decided to move their meeting. And so then our faculty had then scheduled their classes to account for those meetings. That was no longer possible. And so we we're, were facing an uphill climb into this process and then rather try to tinker it. Um, the discussion was um, rather spirited, actually, but positive toward the direction. We had very good attendance in the room. 26 people signed in, and it was a, a voice vote and draft of the statement of those individuals that this entire process needs to be worked over if it's expected to contribute toward function as a shared governance process. We're outgunned and outweighed in those meetings in a way that where you really need equal footing at the table to be able to speak to that and have your opinion heard. If you're a minority person in a room or minority constituents, there needs to be some understanding and stopping of the clock, in my opinion, to allow an underdog opinion to be taken at full measure and full value in order to be heard and implemented or to establish the worth of it. And that yet, then it's a nutshell of it. Any questions? I noticed on the August 15th, you had like 54 people attending. And I was going to ask mm. how many attended on the 13th, but you just said 26. Correct. So that's half. Did they not show up because they were teaching or because they couldn't get off or? I don't know. We don't chart it that way, really. You always get more at convocation because that's the yeah. return back to school. Right. You know, but 26 is a pretty good, healthy number. And you feel that's a good representation of the faculty? Yes, sir. Great. It was a unanimous vote on that. Um, and I'll take the opportunity to mention that following this then uh, was an issue, uh, a motion to return uh, the conversation of investigating the pros and cons of unionization initiative for the faculty, and that also was unanimously agreed upon. What that means is it's return to the conversation of investigating the propriety or appro appropriate nature of a union initiative for the faculty here at the college, and that also was unanimously voted upon. That was a conversation that had been started years ago, and we've come and gone on it, and that feels like time to return to that conversation. Chair Yes, ma'am. I'd like to ask a question. Yes, ma'am. What are some of your suggestions or the faculty suggestions to fix the, the issue of shared governance? What would I, be besides changing the, the... I appreciate that. There was conversation in the room. The clock ran out of us in that last faculty senate may, meeting, and we realized the necessity of coming forward with proactive conversation in that capacity, in that regard. I think the first thing that needs to happen, frankly, is to start a conversation process and get the parties back to the table to see how it's going to work or if it's going to work. There's probably too many councils at seven, and if they're going to, some are larger than others at this point, but if one of those has eight subcommittees, it's very difficult geometrically to ex figure that that type of committee and subcommittee process is going to proliferate how people can leave classes long enough to really actively participate 
and the, I think the whole thing needs to be conversed, frankly. To expand the number of faculty representing faculty, what do you suggest about that? Changing the, the schedules, or what else could, could we do to have faculty attend? Yeah, there has been some discussion about maybe having a different process involved in how the council structures work. There's been some discussion about do you need seven? Can they be collapsed to four? Could those meet at the same time monthly or weekly when there's not like classes stacked against them? But we had faculty members who had already were assigned to council structures and then the times of those councils were set without conferring with the faculty membership on it. That is perceived as you know, you're diminuated in that process when, when that happens. Um, Martha? So, you mentioned a policy. Yes, ma'am. That probably needs some review in your view, in your... Um, 1-11? Yeah. It's the shared governance policy itself. Um, I think the current iteration of it is dated maybe 2008. Uh, the former iteration of the board worked into it. Um, there's some linguistic and structural changes that would need to be reviewed, you know, to keep it dated. The whole thing, policy and procedures, currently resides entirely in policy. Um, as the college, I think that to look at it proactively, my personal opinion, and this is what I've said to my peers, is that it's also an opportunity to look at it and how to expand and apply its meeting in a consistent way for everybody. You will note when we talk about our board goals that one of the major goals this year is to really study all of the policies that exist at SFCC and that should be one of them itself. Thank you. Yeah. Um, faculty are expected by the college to perform college service. That typically means a committee assignment. That's part of the service that sure. faculty is to do. We don't have a good way ourselves to track that, you know, but then getting the meeting times into a situation or time frame that we're able to participate is the first big step. We can't do it at this point. And in this process, since we came back, we can't even get back to the position of where we left it in May. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Kathy and then Linda. Clark, um, a quick question for you following up on uh, last spring. I know the faculty were concerned about the um, pay grade information around the pay grade systems and how they were decided and what the rationale was behind them. Mm -hmm. Have you been um, provided that and have faculty have a chance to look at that and provide you input? I, in the, at the convocation, the meeting of August 15th that you have and Chris is referring to, there was conversation around on that. Individuals, I believe, were able to reach some resolution by either going to Mr. Grissom or into HR. Uh, questions came to us at Faculty Senate and then we uh, forward them really into that direction first. Systemically, we have not. Um, I know that faculty did work on the matrices along with uh, Ms. Guzman, Dr. Guzman, excuse me, um, and that we believe that we know how they're applied. There may or may not be some consistent or reading, I don't have a summative viewpoint on it really, um, but of how individual length of time or service or career was applied to it. Originally there were some questions about that and I think there were some anomalies of individuals actually being out past the last step in the matrices. So some people were grandfathered in at a different rate. Actually, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Linda? So I just want to clarify that the way the quality process is working now is not really working because you all do not have adequate input. That is correct. That is we adequate. cannot consistently get to the meetings. The understanding what this system should provide with benefit in my mind from the very beginning was that there'd be a more distributed ability of faculty members individually to attend and to participate in the various council structures and then return back to faculty senate and inform the body. Um, that has simply not occurred. We had it running a little bit in the first semester and about halfway through the spring, I felt like it was working. And then people got busy with the end of the semester perhaps, but then returning back into the fall semester, we lost purchase in our appointments into committees that councils that were already assigned. So, do you know what other colleges do to address this problem? It must be mm. somewhat I do not. Fair to be fair, yeah. We should probably, I'll take the effort and try to do some more research, I think, into that. Is that a suggestion? 
Yeah, colleges have different processes or capabilities involved in it. Um, but those that are committed to AQIP and the quality process, there must be lots of experience with how to make sure faculty has a strong voice. Yes, and that, it, that occurs within faculty senate. I mean, there had been sort of a lack of enthusiasm that I subjectively noticed or objectively noticed, I guess, as well, upon faculty in returning to the semester. Um, and then in this meeting, we, the agenda that we sent out, you'll receive it, I think, in the next board packet, we returned to issues that people wanted answers to. And it was a much more spirited turnout engagement. And then I opened the conversation up, and this is what people wanted to do. This is what people wanted answers to. You know, that, it's, that part of it is not working. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair? And I think it's very healthy to, for the faculty to see whether what was developed with them is working or not. I think uh, some of the meeting times were changed because the faculty said that in the mornings uh, that was the worst of time and so most of the quality councils were changed to the afternoon. The, uh, so all Baldridge, uh, all AQIP colleges have councils. And so we have to, we, and the faculty supports AQIP. And so if, this, if the faculty supports AQIP, we have to find a way to have councils that you feel are valuable and, and uh, you're willing to give the time to. Uh, the other thing that we did is when you mentioned that there were there were so many administrators we went from having three deans in each of the councils to having just one dean in each of the councils mm -hmm. and and so when the last time I looked and, and we'll look again there were there were about equal representation between faculty administrators and staff so that no one uh, group uh, would feel like they weren't being represented. I think sometimes the problem was that <clears throat> Faculty Senate had some problems in assigning faculty to attend and so the logistics of it I think has been challenging uh, but we're happy to go back to the drawing table. I think that if you look at what the councils produced last year were a lot of, of uh, policies and, and a lot of work done in the academic and student services council. Uh, the marketing council did a good job and, as well as the uh, administrative council. And so I think that the work that has been done has been valuable. Uh, if the faculty doesn't f feels like they want more representation, we'll look at it. But I will send to the board kind of the ratios in each of the councils, uh, because when we allocated uh, the faculty, staff, and administration, the purpose was to have semi-equal representation so that people would feel like they had enough representation to, in each of the councils. Yeah. It, and I understand that and appreciate it. You, you know, it's just I'm bringing forward what the opinion of the group is, but it's also informed by my own experience. And the earlier of those meetings were, there was a great deal of enthusiasm perhaps in the beginning. And so an early iteration of the Academic Learning Council, I think it was called mm -hmm. at the time, probably yeah. had 30 people in it. I mean, it's a, I mean, it's like a difficult crew to herd at that point and eventually it dissipates down mm -hmm. I think in some regards and a good one that I had the opportunity to sit in for a period of time not that any of them were or weren't really you know but the marketing and public relations council helped me a lot from my role as gallery and from the art department to understand kind of what the college was seeing and doing mm -hmm. you know um, and so that I thought was a great function but then again we did have several people that were committed to the group and came back in the fall and lo they had set their teaching schedule to it and then the councils had moved you know it's a lot of work to participate in those councils and I think that you know, we may need to think about stipends. Uh, we may need to think about one of the ideas that the faculty has brought up is to have one hour a week or two hours a week where there are no classes scheduled mm -hmm. and then have all the meetings during. Some colleges do that. Yeah. 
And so I look forward to working through and um, bringing out a new reiteration. We're going to continue having the councils. Uh, because there are faculty that are attending that aren't in the in the Senate. You know, when we first made those councils up, there was Senate that appointed faculty as well as deans that appointed faculty, and the deans haven't given me any feedback that those faculty uh, don't want to attend either. Yeah, and the website, if it shows accurate and up-to-date appointments, to those councils and their attendees. It's happened within the past day or so. Okay. Um, and we've tried to receive updated information from the college and it's also out of date. Okay. And so rather than try to like untangle it on our end, okay. the, the efforts seem to be just say, look, this isn't working for us. What else can we do? Okay. You know. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. I have a comment. Yes. Um, I think it's important that, uh, you know, when, when we as a board have reviewed uh, presentations from Dr. Guzman concerning the, the faculty. The thing that I remember and the thing I, I hold on to is that, you know, the, the, the faculties up there, you know, in importance. And, and when we worked out the, when we worked out the, the raises and, and extending the, the, the schedule and all that, I, the, you know, faculty was first priority. And I think that, I think, uh, I think my confidence in the faculty is is strong you know i have confidence in you and and uh, and i know because of students and people in the community of how how good the faculty is so just as a board chair you know i want to pass that on is that you know that that whatever whatever there might be in the councils or whatever we need to work out i i think we just need to do that it's just it's a matter of just doing it and and getting it done and having it happen you know because because I do, I have confidence in the faculty, and I, I, I know that you know they're doing a great job, and that our first priority was, and not to not to you know talk badly about the staff or whatever, but you know that the the faculty got, you know the, the chunk, of the raises and stuff, and so I, I that I think that, when it comes down to it, you know the the money shows that, and and we need to, and I know I know we need to. To work on on the, the the quality and work on the on the councils and stuff like that's fine. I mean, I understand that, but just as a comment, you know, that I have I have confidence in the faculty. Yeah, thank you. I, I very much appreciate that. It's faculty. I think have a different, and this is documented actually in writings that you can find in trade literature like AAUP of. Faculty historically will have, it's a pretty broadly acknowledged, a different view of the role of the institution uh, that may be different than how the board sees it or how the staff sees it even. I kind of compare it to maybe being left-handed opposed to right-handed, you know. <laughs> um, but it's all in support of what the mission is. And so faculty traditionally, when the students are designated as customers, you know, which they are in some part of that relationship, it really doesn't capture from traditionally from faculty's role of what we're trying to do with students, which is trying to encourage them to develop fully as human beings and as citizens, you know, in their own best behalf as individuals, replacement in a democracy. And so phrases like that, I mean, it reminds, it, the discussion in fact then compares that sometimes to being a consumer, which is so when these monikers or definitions are applied to people, it seems to be then at the service of another prerogative. We don't traditionally, like broadly, always relate to that necessarily. Um, and another one that was discussed recently, you know, was terms of workforce. We know that we have workforce development here at the college. That's a traditional phrase. Career training is one that fits easier kind of into my ears. Um, but then we hear workforce, and so we, we have a more we try to have a kind of expanded definition of that, and I'm not trying to leave anybody out in that regard, but faculty's perspective and dialogue and experiences in those capacities need to have equal place and ability to get purchase and furtherance in that council structure, right? Because we are individuals who've dedicated, hopefully, you know, the best part of our career and our working lives to these humanitarian goals, and that's a more easier way for us to understand it in that sense. It's closer to what our internal dialogue Mm -hmm. is in that sense. And, and we understand that you have to have the administration and the money and the organization in order to make it work. You know, there's no contest about it, um, but we're perceiving it and dialoguing from a different perspective that contributes to the whole. Yeah. 
Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Great. Appreciate it. Clark. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Oh, I think that, you know, the board was, has been really committed to the quality process, and so I'm concerned that we're having some, some glitches with that. So I hope that we can resolve this. I mean, it's great that we, I'm, I'm, you know, happy that we had the money to be able to increase salaries for both faculty and staff, but they must, but you all must be part of shared governance or it's not going to work. So thank you. Thank I you mean, for they're bringing this forward. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Lee. Right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, staff Senate report. Good evening, members of the board, uh, Dr. Guzman. Um, I uh, we've only had one staff Senate meeting since the last board meeting. Uh, which was also on August 15th. You have the minutes in your packet. Um, the, uh, I'll certainly take any questions that you have. The only matter that I want to draw attention to um, was the update on the staff Senate letter to the president. Um, the letter uh, was submitted to the president on July 31st, and you saw that in your last board packet. Um, this meeting was August 15th. We'd not yet received a response from the president, but we did receive one about a week later, a brief two-page response. Um, that was um, that uh, sort of generally acknowledged the concerns of the staff and addressed a few of the points, um, but there were very few specific responses to the very, I think, specific um, questions and requests that were raised in the letter. Um, I did learn uh, that um, yesterday uh, the president has requested um, the Office of Planning and Institutional Effectiveness, which I am now a part of. Um, since just a couple weeks ago, surprise, um, that um, uh, that look further at, in further detail at both the staff and faculty senate letters to address some of the concerns with more specificity. But at this point, um, we just have that brief response that was um, submitted about uh, two or three weeks after uh, the letter was submitted to the president. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another staff senate meeting tomorrow, um, and. Uh, We'll see what the if there's further discussion on that. So, did we get a copy of that response? I'm not sure. I'll check and see. Have gotten that. I think you had a lot of legitimate concerns in that letter, and so I hope we can get some of those addressed. Any well, and I plan to use the meetings that I have with the faculty senate and the uh, staff senate to go through because even though susan you think they were rather specific uh we we looked at them as a group and really didn't understand uh what was being said or asked for and so i think that it's a process it's a process where um we work through what what uh what are the uh, what are the abilities for the faculty senate and the staff senate, and what are the abilities of the administration to satisfy some of those? And and sometimes it's the lack of money, and sometimes it's the um, the guidance of what the students need. Always having student success as the overriding variable for all of our decisions. Like, I know the staff will appreciate actually having responses specific to the issues that were raised in the letter. Uh, any other questions from the minutes? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Student report. Thank you, Chair Abeda and members of the board. I'll make this brief. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I just had a couple things. I want to remind people of our meeting tomorrow from 12 to 1 in Hemis 3. So whoever wants to come is welcome. Uh, we are also we are still looking for SGA senators, and it would be must appreci uh, appreciated if you can get it out to the students. Let them know we still need uh, the senators. We do have someone that applied for the vice president position. Um. October 1st is college night, 
and Santa Fe Community College is open house from 6 to 8. So anyone that wants to attend or know someone that's just going to be graduating high school or looking to go to college, there's 65 colleges around the United States that are coming. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is I attended the lottery, lottery scholarship summit this past Saturday as the SGA president, and we are trying to make some better adjustments to a bill in the uh, legislature towards the scholarship. So thank you. I have a question. Uh, yes. Sir. Um, did they talk a lot? Uh, did they talk about having the lottery be part time at all? Because there are a lot of high school students that don't belong in college as a full time student, and and that's just the reality of life, you know. And and so, did did anybody bring that up at all? I uh, know. To be truthful, they were talking a lot about trying to save money or get more money. <laughs> Yeah. So they uh, left it like they had uh, student governments from all the colleges around uh, New Mexico. They had the presidents, and we had our own private meeting to uh, help make a bill that they're going to give to the legislature this year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next uh, section uh, would be uh, approval of consent agenda, and um, that would be... We're looking at the governing board retreat for the 19th, the work session on the 20th, and the regular board meeting on August 20th. Uh, do we also, will we also be approving the matters related to the board policy? No, no policy, we're done. Okay, so do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I so move. Second. Second. Um, any discussion? No discussion. All right, all those in favor? Okay, thank you. Approval is done. Okay, so we have action items to be removed. No? We didn't remove any. No. no? Okay. We'll move on to the table. table. So we'll move on to the action items. Uh, approval of the financial report. Do we need to have any... any I have some questions that we didn't have time to go through in the... Okay. And then those questions are directed to who? Dr. Zemer. Okay. Yes, to whoever our finance person is. That's it. There he Go is. ahead, Brian. So on E2, where we have cash balance net of unrestricted funds of $5.1 million, and it, on E2, E2. Um, and it says they're grant funds. If they're grant funds, how are they unrestricted? That is a very good question. And David, David is. Dave in the room. Yeah, David, if you if you want to come work with Dr. Zemer. Thanks, Dave. And this seems to be a new format, sort of. Okay, what is No, we no, tried to keep the old format. We tried to keep the old format. No changes. We to kind of interpret the way it was, it was developed in the past. <laughs> Look at the statement right here. Mm -hmm. Let's go um, back. Let's go back and look at um, the cash. Ms. Siegel, we need to look a little bit farther back in the report, right at the at the cash side. Okay, we're talking about the which area figures. are you talking about in Linda and in instruction and Jeff? Talking about the comment that says on E two cash okay. balance net of unrestricted funds of five million dollars, and it says in parentheses grant funds. Well, I thought grant funds were always restricted. Right, yes, that's, that's that's referring to the lower right block on the uh, schedule about four or five pages back that says cash in banks. And if you flip back a few more pages. But then is that grant funds that are unrestricted? Mm -hmm. What page would that be on? And I'm not sure what page number that is. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five pages back from E2. Well, I don't have any pages above E2 except the cover oh, yeah. page. Oh, yes, we do. 
You don't have E5, E6? I do below. The difference yeah. in these. Okay. Yeah, so that's below what he means. E7. E7. Okay, so we okay. have. So what the what the comment is actually referring to, it actually it may be more clear on the cash in bank schedule than the top report. The comment it's worded perhaps a little bit obtusely, and we'll correct that going forward. It's actually referring to the seven hundred seventy nine thousand seven hundred ninety five dollars at the lower left of the cash in banks schedule. So it's the unrestricted cash available, which includes restricted grants. Well, it, it should it should actually correctly say net of. What's being said is we have a comparative unrestricted net uh, cash balance of 5.949. It should correctly say the 5.1 is is that is net of the 700,000 number, and that's how you get from the 5.949 to the 5.169. We'll correct. We'll correct that for the go forward report. I understand what the confusion is. It's 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 a ter it's a terminology issue in the labels. So what is being said is that the unrestricted cash available is 5.2. That should have been more clearly stated at the um, at the top uh, on the on the MD&A report. Okay. So we we can correct it going forward. I understand what the confusion is. All right. And then on that same page E2, the beginning fund balance. This whole explanation about. Right. The banner, and what, I don't see what right, page does let, that let me let, to? let me boil it down. There's a this was uh, uh, Dave and I worked together to write. Uh, in, in as much as these are public proceedings, it was written in such a way that it, that a reasonably knowledgeable accounting information user who was looking at this would understand what's being said. But let me boil it down, as Chairman uh, uh, Bates, I said earlier, in a little bit simpler language. What happened is when Mary D was developing. The budget for a uh, roll forward last year. Behind the audited 2012 financials, there are a set of exhibits that have notes on them that say these are not actually accounting information. Uh, you can see those in the 2012 audited financials. Um, uh, a beta, uh, Weiner, and Sharon had, I think, four exhibits that were that were labeled uh, essentially as illustrations. And the intention was to say, if such and such a condition occurred, this is how it would look. Now what happened is, um, and, and frankly, having worked with a lot of this data, I understand why, why this pickup would occur. Uh, Mary D was looking for a, an ending balance. She picked it up, rather than picking it up from the audited schedule, which is what Dave is saying here, which would be the $5.6 million number, her eye went to the bottom of an exhibit that over to the left actually had a note that said this is for illustrative purposes only, and she picked up the 7.6 incorrectly. So that's what the that's what the issue is here. Um, Dave wrote the note. I think it's a it's a material number in terms of the adjustment to the schedule itself that it appears on. It is not actually material to the operations of the college district financially, and so that's why we decided the best thing to do is simply to report this error was made for reporting purposes, and that's what the that's what the nature of the explanation is. There's a detailed schedule, by the way. We're on E2. Three, yeah, right, right, three, four, and it, it, it would, I, it, I guess it would be E5, but the last page of the MDNA summary, uh, Mr. Stewart prepared a schedule where he set out, he showed so the board could see what it looked like the way Ms. Walters did it and what it should have looked like. In the middle of the page, you'll see the $7.6 million number that she picked up. And then immediately to the right, you'll see the $5.6 million number, which is actually the correct number from the audited financial. And then you see it come down to the ending fund balance. So what Dave was trying to illustrate here is, is that these, this, for reporting purposes on this schedule, that's why we have a $2 million difference. Any right. commentary yeah. on that to add to that or did that? No, that's, that's but, true. That's well, we don't have an audited number for 13. Right, this is an audited. Oh. Mm -hmm. This uh, is an audited. The, the important thing uh, that you should be looking at is the ending fund balance. If you look all the way to the right, uh, we, we were able to carry over $2.8 million uh, in savings. And, and that will make a huge difference in the amount of monies that we can have in fund balance because we have been low in fund balance in the past, 
and my quest to save money is so that we can increase our fund balance, feel comfortable with that, develop a policy uh, by the board that will say we will have a minimum of X percent in fund balance, which is the way other colleges do it, and, and then feel comfortable in our expenditures. And so really, um, these are unaudited, and, and there may be 100,000 more or less when you get the audited, but it was a, it was a, it was, we worked really hard to produce those savings so that they can go on to the fund balance. But it looks like that fund balance came from the mistake it's, in the in the audit. Right. It's, it's important audit. to distinguish here. We have two sets of numbers, Ms. Siegel. We have the the audited 2012 right. published financial that we reported to the state auditor, mm -hmm. which is where Ms. Walters was starting her report from. And then we have the unaudited numbers, which is everything that occurred after that, which would include, of course, the, the summary here that Dave did going to September 13. Mm -hmm. So what we have here, and I, I should point out, because I think it's a, it's important disclosure, even though, uh, Chair, but it's a little bit accounting technicality <laughs> here. But we, we have a comparison here between audited numbers and unaudited numbers, because I agreed with Dave when we realized what the what the error was we felt like it was important to divulge it because the board has for several months been looking at a report where that 7.6 million number was was reported mm -hmm. now the significant point about dr guzman's point just now is that the other thing that the correction reveals is is that what was actually a technicality of the report of picking up that wrong number was actually hiding a substantive 2.8 million dollar uh, change in fund balances that needed to be seen so we have a, a case of substance over form, which is why when Dave came to me and said this is what the error is, my immediate reaction was we, we can't hide a substantive financial gain for the institution because of an accounting technicality. So our decision was do we explain to the board an error was made that reveals a big savings or do we leave this alone and leave the technical issue uncorrected so we don't get into all this accounting mumbo jumbo, but the board doesn't realize there's a $2.8 million gain. Exactly. I'm just trying to clarify so. that that $2.8 million is from a mistake in picking up the wrong number. The, what would happen is, is that the, the, the difference between the 7.6 and the 5.6 by picking up the wrong number it will result in a funds flow in the analysis that you're seeing where you would not realize that the bottom of that report is actually netting to $2.8 million. Mm -hmm. It would reflect to you as though the bottom of the report was netting somewhere close to zero. And we would all congratulate ourselves that we either saved $50,000 or whatever. With this corrected, you see it as, as it actually is. The board has been making decisions on the basis of saying, well, we seem to be a few hundred thousand dollars to the good. This is what Dave realized the other day. We're not a few hundred thousand dollars to the good. We're about $2.8 million to the good, and that's a material number, like about 8% of our, of our annual uh, budget. Yep. But so that's, I'm trying to understand what you're saying is that was a, an error that the wrong fund balance was originally picked up. She, what, what she did is pick up an exhibit number that should not actually have been reported to the board as a substantive accounting number. And again, referring back to the 2012 audited financials, they're not here as an exhibit just because they're published and everybody has waved their hands over them already, so we figured you had seen them before. But by picking up that number, it actually changed the flow of these fund balances. Mm -hmm. Now, it didn't change it adversely in a way that the board would say, gee, we're, we're, we're $1.4 million upside down, and so it was shocking and we would have immediately fixed it. What it did was reduce the positive changes that were being made last year. So this is, again, it's a substance over form issue. Uh, we really, Dave and I really had quite a debate about whether or not we were going to put this in the board report because we knew it would result in some dialogue. But my, my judgment was it would be better to make sure the board understood the nature of the issue, it did not harm the institution. I think, in fact, it reveals benefit to the, the institution. I mean, it clearly, it clearly does. And going forward, we'll work with that. And of course, um, with, with, with deference to my, my predecessor, in all honesty, I have done so many of these reports that when your eyes are tired at 11 o'clock at night, it is extremely simple to pick up a number from the bottom of an exhibit 
and overlook that .06 note to the left that says, hey, don't use this number except for informational purposes, and so that's what should have happened. Um, and thus, thus the issue. Thank you. So, okay. did, I, did, I cover, did I cover that? <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Dave, Dave, yeah. Dave is the consigliere of the accounting yeah, department, right. so I just want to make sure that I, did we get, I, think, I think that's all the bones in that yeah, particular right. closet. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. So. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so do we have a motion to approve the financial report? So moved. Second. 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 Okay. Uh, any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of approving the financial report July uh, 2013? Aye. Aye. Okay. Anybody opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Um, approval of the annual equipment inventory part one and part two. Could I uh, say something about this since I'm on the agenda for it? Uh, this is to help us not get an audit finding like we did last year that we failed to bring the annual equipment inventory before the board and get approval. So we had a note um, about this that says Per NMAC 2.216E, they cited annual inventory. The result of the fiscal inventory shall be recorded in a written inventory report, certified as to correctness, and signed by the governing authority of the agency. In the process of conducting their field work, the state auditor or independent public accountant under a contract approved by the state auditor may test the correctness of the inventory and generally accepted auditing principles. And it goes on to say the physical inventory fixed assets for the year ended June 30th, 2012 was not completed and approved by the completion of the field work of the audit. The college is not in compliance with NMSA section 1361C. We were unable to test the governing board certification as to the correctness of the physical inventory for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2012. So this is just to avoid for this fiscal 13 such a finding. Yeah. We moved <laughs> so now you see how many computers we have and how many things we have. And there are plenty. Thank you, David. Thank you. Do we have okay. to vote? Mr. Yeah, we have to. Yes. Mr. Chair, Chair, I move approval of the annual equipment inventory. Okay. So second. All right. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Those opposed? Motion passes. Okay, now we have approval of resolution banking. Uh, Amy? Good evening, everyone. Um, this is just to formalize our practices for banking. Um, one of the banks had actually requested that we had a formalized statement giving the authorities. So I'm open for any questions. It's not very exciting. <laughs> Yeah, we do. We do. It's, I don't have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are these the normal, yeah. the regular people who get this authority? Yes. Any other questions? Move yep. I know. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm very exciting. <laughs> oh, you have a question? Second. Okay. First, second. Six. Any discussion? That was easy. <laughs> Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Anyone opposed? Okay, that motion passes. Now the approval to seek legislative funding. But, but you're taking Randy's place? I'm taking Randy. Oh, okay. oh, good. No, that's okay. That's fine. That's fine. I'm sorry, I wasn't sure, but he asked me to come, so. Perfect. Okay. Do you want to start and I can? No, no, you go ahead. <clears throat> so we want to ask the, we're basically requesting your approval to submit an RPSP 
Research and Public Service Project in the amount of $396,750. Um, my name is Kristen Krell and I direct a Department of Labor grant. And one of the components of this grant is we implemented a program called IBEST and we're the lead institution. It's a consortium grant. There's six colleges across the state. Is anyone here familiar with IBEST? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's great because it gets low-skilled adults into content area career pathways like home health aid, early childhood development, culinary, and they're accelerated certificates that are embedded in degrees, degree programs, and then it provides the ABE support um, to build their basic skills, literacy and math skills. So it makes a lot of sense. It's a national program. If you're interested in more information, I'd be happy to come and do a more thorough presentation on it. That would be great. But we're, we're currently experiencing a lot of success with it, but our grant ends in a year. So we have a plan as a statewide consortium, and I've spoken with Dr. Guzman about this, to pursue legislative funding to sustain this program because we're right at that critical point where we need the funds. We're, we've accomplished a lot. If the funds disappear, it all falls apart. Mm -hmm. So October 1st, an RPSP is due. And um, I believe we have the support of Dr. Guzman and, and Randy Grissom and our consortium partners and the higher ed department as well has provided guidance as well as the legislative finance. We've gotten guidance from a number of different, different folks involved. And so I feel like we have a very good chance at this. So that'll be $396,750. And that will fund, it, part of that money will be funneled out to our consortium partners but will be the lead institution. So it pays for the coordination of IBEST um, at the s both statewide and each institution will receive funds to coordinate the program. So um, that is the official request. Is it worth mentioning the adult basic ed increase now as well that we hope to pursue? Yeah. Okay, so the other component um, that we plan on pursuing that I think it would be important to, for you to know and hopefully we can get your support on is we would like to request an increase in House Bill 2 for the adult basic education budget specifically earmarked to fund ABE teachers that are working in IBEST um, because it we don't want to take the current ABE funds because there's a huge need already of low skilled adults that are testing below sixth grade and to take away funding that serve those students when there's such a huge need doesn't make sense so we're we believe that the right route to take is asking for an increase in the ABE budget through the higher ed department and we believe we have considerable support for this as well and that amount would be seven hundred thousand seven hundred dollars and that's um, not on here that's not on our form. We have the microgrid project and nursing expansion, expansion. health care. Yeah, Do you have so any that, that one, I'm just planting the seed that yeah. that's something that we're separate. pursuing. I don't think at this point no, it ready. requires official approval. I'm happy to come. I don't know exactly what the process would be to get your official approval, but it's something that maybe I can get your guidance on. Um, so the official question on that. Yes. And that goes to all the ABE programs? If that would go... Are doing IBEST? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And is that all... Or how many programs are doing IBEST? Currently, there's six. Our hope and plan is to expand to nine. Um, we're working closely with Frances from the higher ed department, and she believes that at least three more colleges are interested in implementing IBEST. So that funding amount would be... And I'm happy to sit down and go over that budget with you in more detail that we're preparing, that we've prepared, that supports this uh, request. Well, the, the good thing about this request is that SFCC is taking the leadership, uh, looking at a year from now, because we're going to be the, we have a, a, a Department of Labor grant. And as a Department of Labor grant, we are the lead institution to these other colleges that are implementing IBEST. Well, we got together and we said, well, what happens when that grant ends? Because the HED is, has tremendous support for IBEST, and we thought that they would be very interested in funding us to continue to be the lead college for the state and then uh, provide funds 
for the I best classes that would that would allow us to continue because how many have we graduated this year? Uh, so this year, and this is only, we've only delivered it for two semesters, we had 39 um, certificate completed. That's just at Santa Fe Community College. Right. Uh, the, we're working on our official data for our annual performance report, but um, 108, 169 total certificate completers within our first year of program, of, wow. of delivery, and that's across the state. This and is one of the best programs that, that we can do for students who have left high school or students who have just graduated from high school but really don't have, and then end up with, with all developmental classes and really don't have the skills. And that's the other part that we're going to be doing next year. We're not only going to be working with iBEST for, for the GED, but also for those students who we have found, if they qualify for developmental in all three areas and they're at the bottom of the developmental in all three areas, they need a certificate to get themselves working, to get themselves feeling good about themselves and then come back to college. Mm -hmm. And I do want to let you know, 69% of those tested have also shown skill gains. So yes. the focus is not just on certificate completion, it's on building their basic skills, literacy and math skills. So rather than having to go through the developmental ed, which we all know is lengthy, timely, expensive, it, it does the, at the same time and it's contextualized mm -hmm. to, the, to the content area. It really makes a lot of sense. It really does. So, I have a comment. Yeah. Um, having Rise. worked in ABE, um, have you worked with Letty uh, to do like a presentation at the ABE conference, which is coming up in October? Is there anything happening there to, to get something, information out or whatever need be with all the other ABE programs? Yes, actually last year we presented at the ABE conference and we work really closely with Letty on this. Yeah, she's a part of our state. And so that's, that's coming up also, right? Yeah. Okay, we'll make sure we're on the agenda. Super. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. President, I- um, uh, Kathy? Chair, sorry, I move approval of the resolution to seek- Okay, second. Second. All right. No more questions. Uh, all those in favor of the approval uh, for uh, to seek legislative funding? Aye. Aye. And that is. So uh, anybody opposed? Oh. To this? This one? You'll do that no, later. she said this she would not. Later. For the RPSP. Yeah. I'll come back and work with Dr. Guzman on our how to approach the ABE. But this will all have to be separate bills. And Virginia will have to get the capital outlay. And that's why Virginia is here. Delegation and yeah. So all of this will. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Virginia wants to say something. Virginia. I'm not a Virginia. I just need a clarification. These are strictly operational Come on up. dollars. I, I'm just asking. The yes. They are. These are strictly Ex operational dollars. Yes. Except the one capital. Right. RPSP, the 300,000, that is for one year. Okay. Um, this, I mean, <coughs> our hope is that it's ongoing and that we find a way to make it sustainable. Um, then, then there's the ABE funding as well. It looks like we should probably get together and talk yeah. through the details yeah. of it. And that'll be separate. Yeah. Okay. So the operational dollars is Mr. Mr. Chair and uh, members of the board and, of course, uh, board member Siegel will have to be approached differently than the capital dollars for infrastructure. Right. So we do yeah. need to meet about that. The strategy. Okay. okay. Yes, thank you. thank you. Thank you for the clarification. And with the other colleges, lobbyists too, and who are supporting so you know, this. Mm -hmm. So just so you know, we are working with all the IBEST colleges. They're making, we made a presentation to Dr. Guzman. We have a strategy to approach all of the presidents so yes, we're, we're, we're well aware of that and we're working towards it. And, um, and I'm, we're getting some very good guidance from a number of folks. Um, Dr. Winograd is very involved in this, Peter Winograd, and is helping figure out um, kind of who needs to be involved and a strategy for approaching the, the folks that need to be approached. So. I would suggest talking to Virginia and working closely with her. On I'll do that. Helping you do that. I will do that, yes, thank you. Thank you. And Dr. G with Dr. Guzman, of course, as well. I assume you want to be at the table for that meeting. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten.
Okay, uh, we already had a presentation in our work session for the approval uh, or for the solar uh, photovoltaic project. And so do you have any questions concerning that? If not, then we'll just do a, a vote on that. Yeah, I move that we approve it. Second. Second. Okay, uh, uh, all those in favor of approval of this, uh, the uh, solar photovoltaic project for the HEC. In favor? Aye. Aye. Any, anyone opposed? Thank you. That that um, that passes. Okay. Five zero. Hi, gang. Hi. Huh? Um, okay. Now we are going to be discussing the RFP for legislative services to, um, and so uh, legal service. I'm sorry, <laughs> legislative service. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> RFP for legal services, Bob. That's been fulfilled. Chair Beta, Madam President, members of the board, um, I can start this from the very beginning. We, we discussed it a little bit at the, um, at the work session, but I'll start over at the beginning just so we're all clear. The contract, our current contract for legal services expires at the end of October of this year. Uh, it does have a, uh, an item in the contract that allows us at mutual agreement to extend for one year. Um, currently, I have an RFP open for legal services, and, that, and that's why I've come to you for guidance. The reason we've gone out is it being the end of the contract, we had two options, but we wanted to do a couple things. I mean, when you go out to RFP, you check the market, see what, you know, what firms are out there who might be interested in us, what they have to offer, those type of things. You can benchmark your pricing. Um, because prices change. We last awarded this contract in 2010. And then our current vendor is always allowed to uh, participate in the RFP as well. And therefore, even if they were to win again, at least we would have a review of the pricing and review of the contract and, and, and make any changes that were appropriate. Um, in the, since this has all been in process, I, I've come to understand that the board may have some different ideas on how we should approach this. And so I'm here for some guidance. Um, we have several options. As I said, one of those options is at mutual agreement, we can extend the current agreement, in which case we'd be doing the same process again next year because you can only have it a contract for four years for professional services. We can, um, I understand there's been some interest of potentially having two legal contracts, uh, one for um, managing college operations and one for doing uh, legal services for the board. Um, and, and that there's some options within that. We can even retain the current uh, uh, firm to do that and continue with the RFP or whatever. Again, this is an option. And then, um, the, or, or the final one is, is, is that actually to do nothing and just re-up re it. So I'm looking for some direction as to how I should proceed. The fact that the RFP is open, there's nothing that precludes us from closing an RFP and saying we've, we've made a, a different decision. However, if we want to go forward with this, we need to come to conclusion by the end of October, which means you would have to approve it at the October board meeting. That, that's where I'm at, and I'm okay. looking for direction. Yeah, I have a question. Um, it seems to me that the board and the college are one and the same. That's so correct. So why would we engage different attorneys for the college and different attorneys for the board? That would be your decision. I, I only would issue the RFPs to, to meet the needs that you felt are required. If you do not feel that that's a requirement, um, that would be your decision. I have talked with some schools. I haven't encountered anybody who has two separate firms. There were some colleges that I have, uh, and when I say contacted them, I'm a member of the National Association of Educational Procurement. I put a listserv question out there. Some colleges have said that in the past they had that, but they've expanded to the point where they now have in-house counsel as employees, and then they have a firm that represents their board. So no one has it as two outsourced firms, but several have them as in I mean, um, hired attorneys in-house and, and then a contract for additional services. But again, these are all different models that everybody uses. I'm familiar with the, with the contracts where you have internal legal counsel, which serves a very different role than when you contract services out. It seems to me that it might get competitive if we start thinking our, of ourselves as the college and the board. If Well, I mean, if you wanted my advice, I would not recommend that. But I've been told that that's something that someone has considered. I see. 
Thank you. Andrea? Uh, my comments have to do with the RFP itself. I, I think competition is very healthy, and as long as the current vendor can be part of it, I don't see any, any kind of problem with that. It would be to the benefit, their benefit and ours. It's usually a common practice uh, in procurement when you issue that to always ask the incumbent vendor to apply, right. particularly if they're doing a good job. Yeah. Well, Linda? Since it's only one year that we can extend on the existing contract, I'd just like to see us extend and then think about this in a year. I, I would prefer not to postpone things because if we have to go through this again next year, why don't we do it now and just get it get it over with? Um, Marta? Part of part of my rationale for extending this year and maybe looking at it in a longer term process, I think we need more information about how this works. We need to look at that policy pretty carefully. Um, it seems to me we lose nothing um, and we gain a lot of history in being able to continue the contract as it is. And in the meantime, as um, Linda has, has indicated, if there is some, I mean, we can study it more carefully than simply uh, moving on it expeditiously. I, I must, what policy were you referring to? Because this, this is just purchasing RFP for services. I'm not. I'd like to no, I mean, I'd help you I do that. You raised the question about the difference between RFPs and contracts, and you and I have had some conversation about that. But I think that bears a longer discussion and a more careful review of existing uh, process or policy in other institutions. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Linda. Well, I was going to make a motion. Well, uh, I have I have a question. Um, uh, of Martha. Martha, are you saying that, that this needs to be tabled so that... No, no, I think we should ex we should move to extend the contract for a year, as is. Right. Uh, tabling is not an option because we have to make a decision. Make okay, a decision. that's, that's, uh, <coughs> that was my question. We'll make a move. What, is, what is the, what is the question? No, my question was that uh, that we have to make a decision because I was going to request also postponing since we haven't discussed this and we haven't done any research, and I hate to move into something uh, accepting a contract as is when we don't really know if it's working or not. Yeah. Well, I, uh, my comment is that I, I just I don't feel we've we've uh, we've discussed it enough. I don't I don't feel comfortable with it in the sense of of extending a contract for for my part. Um, I I just wanted to be because other that's what the question I was going to ask is have other colleges done the the one for the board and one for other other college things and so I think that to me that's that's worth exploring and looking at that and and uh, and and going to that but as the chair I don't vote on it right so. Yes, you do. Well, I don't think we have a choice. We we have to do something. So I would move that we extend the current contract for a year, and we can renegotiate, I guess, sort of. Yeah, we can renegotiate that. Second. Second. All those in favor of uh, renewing the contract? Is that correct? Well, extending the contract. extending the contract for one year. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Andrea is opposed. Please note that. Just so we understand, the, it is by mutual agreement. I don't imagine our attorneys will say no, but they have to say yes as well. <laughs> they have to agree? <laughs> yes. It's by mutual agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Okay, and... Um, the last one that we were going to do would be for um, uh, discussion of board goals, and that would be uh, Martha and Kathy. Right. Um, at our retreat in August, we were charged with uh, developing the goals for the board for this year. Uh, what was in the packets and is probably on Jack is was our earlier version of this, and we have re, 
designed it a bit so that we have actually separated some of that out into goals. And I assume that that can be put, that can be corrected on the, in the. Um, sure, I, I need a copy. Yeah, I'll give you a copy. I have a copy for you. So the four goals that, or the five goals that we at our retreat agree, uh, agreed needed to be fleshed out. And this is with a uh, conversation from all the folks, um, well, from all of us at the, at the meeting. Uh, so the first goal is to improve communications um, across the institution, actually. The second one is to improve responses to the community regarding college governance, and there are some action steps that we've noted. The third one would be to forge a working relationship with the higher education center institutions and the public school system um, and, the, and the SFCC Foundation to identify common goals and strategies to better serve students and our communities. The fourth one is to systematically review all college policies by the end of 2014 spring semester. Uh, that's the one I was um, referring to earlier to, uh, when we talked with Clark. And then the fifth one was to engage, the board engage in professional development throughout the year. And there are action steps under each of these that you should be able to see. Um, I move that we approve it. They've done a very good job putting those together after our discussion at the retreat. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd like to make a comment on, uh, on goal number two, um, improve responses to the community. There's nothing having to do with the community, so I'd like to see if there could be some kind of, of action step that would refer to the community, not just internal, internal, you know, the president, the board, the attorney, the, you know, there, there's no reference to the community, and that's what the actual goal says. And so I'd like to, if we could somehow, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm into approving it, but I mean, I just would like to see expanded, or if I could do that, expand it a little more so that there can be some action steps that really, rather than, you know, to actually follow what the goal says, you know, to improve response in community, in the community, you know, and, and you know, so I'd like to do that. So what was... I think we were thinking about that in terms of B, which is the media contact. But um, I'm. I think we're open to. Um, what kind of language would you like to put in there? No, just just uh, something that would be, because that's actually that's actually what I feel is my purpose. My purpose is to communicate with the community and to be there for the comunidad and for the gente from Santa Fe. And it says nothing of that here. And and so that that's what my my goal would be, just to be able to communicate with the community both ways whatever and because i do a lot of listening and i do a lot of communicating and i think i've already i already do a lot of that so i just want to include whatever we define as community as a wider type of thing you want to talk about community groups or do you just want to leave it that broad i think it would be broad broad it, it, you know which would include community groups community individuals and you know and community organizations and and different di you know saying going to the for example, going to the board, you know, the pueblos. yeah, and the pueblos and different things, I, you know, because because I've been in contact with a lot of those people through ABE and just as a community activist, mm -hmm. you know, I we'll think add that as a as another action step. How's that? Yes. And then um, maybe you can talk about the the format, and you can fill that out in your in sure. your homework. <laughs> sure, that's fine. The and other thing would be the uh, elections that you went to the public schools to, so that we can combine our elections. That was a, that was a proposal last year. That would be part Although of it. the public schools exactly. and all that. Yeah, totally. Exactly. You know, and, and, and just being involved in the community. That's, that's my thing. And so I want to continue that, you know, I want to, I want to do that. And I think it's important for the board. For the rest of you to know, we each at our work session agreed that we would each take one of those goals to um, shepherd. And this is the one that um, Chair Abeta is going to do. <laughs> so. Yeah. So. Um, I would like to um, move. Add, oh. We already have a. I'll, we have I'll oh. second. But okay. I think we should add on number four among policies to be reviewed, we should add shared governance. I just did. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And that's you. That's you, right, Linda? Yeah. 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 So. All right. Uh, so we have a, we have a motion. 
uh, to approve uh, the the goals. Um, second. Uh, we already have a second. Okay. So uh, before we vote, we just want to point out there's there's two parts in the process. We've developed the goals to work on, and each one of the board members is going to um, put together an action planning sheet, which is our homework on the goal that we've adopted between this meeting and next meeting, so that we have an action plan for the year. For next for October, is that the expectation? And I suggest that we have a time. Also, so that. I think she's saying October. No, but I'm saying for each one of us to say this will be done by a certain oh. time. So that's a part of the it's Okay, good, good. So thank right. you all for doing yeah. these. They seem very yeah. comprehensive. And now we have to work on the other. Now we have to. <laughs> give us a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> good job. That's because you're the rookies. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And so we have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? The motion passes. And and uh, Donna, you'll get a copy. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll move into the next section: matters related to SFC policy and SFC admission of international students. Is Carmen here? Uh, hey. Student policy. Is that is that? She's ill, and so I, I told her she needed to go home. There you go, Cheryl. Share a bait. This is an information item yeah. or an action? I think it's the first reading. First reading. Okay. Yeah, Chair Abeta, President Guzman, members of the board, nice to see you again. Um, this really, there's no substantive change with this policy and procedure. It was um, more related to getting information accurate. Over a number of years, there are different agencies that um, are in charge. There's no longer immigration, per se, or BCIS. It now is U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services. So the primary changes to the policy just reflect updating and making sure that um, we have accurate information and we still and there were some redundancies in in the policy the international uh, policy already required indicated that students if you're an international student that you cannot be um, a, a citizen for t a resident for tuition purposes and so some of that language that was redundant we removed that and uh, the main thing really was just making those changes to reflect uh, what what is current right now. The procedures are also in place um, and just reflect those same kinds of changes. And, and this was important because next year we really want to go after more international students. Um, I, I think that community colleges uh, really thrive when international students uh, come and and we see how different values and different people live so we're going to really go after international students next year excuse me um, does that mean recruiting in other countries yes sir oh. it does ACC ACC has been very active and and many colleges through many community colleges throughout the nation have been have been working hard on increasing and the Chinese and the Indians are particularly very interested in in sending students to uh, our community colleges for technician programs and that's why we are really uh, developing more technician programs and more certificates that would interest uh, communities abroad. Does anyone know if we're going to be, if there's going to be any workshops at the Seattle conference concerning that, Martha? Probably because they're yes. very, their AACC is very active in that area. Right. The advantage to community college students is that, as we all know, community college students seldom get to travel. Mm -hmm. And when you have students from other countries here, just in the interaction. Students learn about those countries. Students learn about what needs to, uh, uh, about different cultures. They learn about different ways of doing things. And that has been probably the biggest um, advantage to the community college population 
yep. in terms of uh, having in more international students here. Jap Japan is another country that, Japan is, that often says. Well, I know that, that when I was working in ABE, uh, there was one summer that, that we just had a really good connection with uh, Japanese students and, and we set up a whole thing. This doesn't mean that we're going to look into making dormitories, does it? No, it does not. No, it does not. Okay. Uh, Andrea? I just have a comment. Is there a better word than alien to use? Yes, maybe <laughs> that word kind of... Um, I find it a little offensive. I think it actually goes back to how the terminology is through, uh, in working with international students through uh, the U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services. So we tried to, I, we, we talked about that in some of the different uh, governance groups and the councils, but because that is the term, it's an old term that it's, it's still in play. So we left it. We left it there. It's a pretty offensive term. Yeah. yeah. Right. Offensive. So I would love to see immigrant or some other word that, that is a little softer, that makes us feel more or, welcome. Or more current. Or if you do leave it, uh, make reference to the whole Milky Way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me? <laughs> Thank you. A hundred thousand light years, you know? <laughs> a way to do that and you can do one or the other in parentheses so okay you do register okay that this is a term that's yeah, we're not moving acceptable. forward right. okay that's good okay we can do that i'll i'll get that modification My question <laughs> is, this is not going to impact our undocumented no no this is completely different this is for the students that we actually issue f1 visas where they provide information to us um and it goes through their uh, their embassy to actually get permission and that then we also become responsible for the student to ensure that they're taking a full term of classes and other things but the undocumented students are handled completely differently and there actually is under um, residency requirements in New Mexico an allowance for those students to get in-state tuition and we have a large number of the students that that are here Yes, uh -huh. what, or one year, either one year of high school with a GED or high school graduation, and they qualify. And we're, we're very good about letting students know that. Is that in another policy? Um, it, it's in just the general admission policy, because this one is just specifically for international students that um, have not been in New Mexico or that, that wouldn't qualify for the... Um, immigrant, undocumented. But I think this provision, the New Mexico Overt Act requirement, isn't, doesn't that address that? that that's where it addresses um, the undocumented students being al the allowance for that. Uh -huh. and, that is in here. And well, this, because in, in that in that information from the state about residency requirements, it also has specifics about international students and who qualifies and who does not. So that, yeah, it's, it's stated very clearly in that, and I can't remember what section, but it talks about both of those in the guidelines from uh, the state of New Mexico. Uh, Kathy? Can you explain to me, I, I'm still trying to get my arms around the AQIP process. So did this go through an AQIP council or where, where, did, where the, is the policy recommendation coming from? Um, this was one of the things with the councils and um, one of the things that President Guzman asked each of the councils to do was to look at the respective policies that um, are housed under those councils and student success uh, overseas admission and so that this went initially uh, to the student success council which and also the academic affairs council and then it proceeded to go through as it worked its way through and got approval there it proceeded to work its way through the other governance um, agencies governance <laughs> Um, the, the councils in like staff senate and faculty senate and then it ultimately went to the executive team and it was approved there last week I believe so then it comes here for first reading so but this is a good example of something that 
uh, went through that whole process. And there was actually a, a working group that looked at um, other policies at other institutions to see if we needed to make any substantive changes to the policy and didn't really find any other than just updating and making things uh, more aligned with what is actually happening out there. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Thank you. So we'll make that one adjustment uh, with and bring that back. Yeah, really cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Linda, we have you listed for discussion of legislative agenda. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we had it on the agenda and we talked about it earlier. I do have one issue, which is the, the tiering of payments. When I was at uh, a hearing in Las Cruces a few weeks ago, Gary Carruthers, who's the president of the New Mexico State, in his introduction to the committee, started talking about this plan that he has for a three-tiered uh, funding, which is totally different than anything that has been discussed. And he has already met with um, LFC and is going out trying to sell this, and it will be very detrimental to community colleges. And I know that, um, that we have... Uh, Danny Earp back as our yes. executive director, at least temporarily, mm -hmm. hopefully through the session, and he is certainly knowledgeable on these things. So we're going to really, though it's not a legislative issue, the funding will be impacted if uh, HED decides they like Gary's idea and not the ones we've been talking about. So I think we have really got to to get active because this this is disaster for community colleges it would make us the bottom of the oh year. the bot and you know he was talking about it in terms of welding certificates and things like that he i mean you know he runs a big research institution but it's uh it's not going to be good for us if that happens i mean it'll be the end of us So, um, Linda, so what are you suggesting? You say we have to be, is it community people, uh, le legislators? The boards have to get engaged, all the mm -hmm. boards, and we have to be talking to our legislators before mm -hmm. things happen. I mean, we don't have much influence over HED, but... We, uh, we do have influence over the funding, so. Do we need to make a, a, a board statement uh, that goes to the legislature, or do we, you know, something that's official? That might be helpful yeah, with that our delegation. That would be a good idea. Once Resolution. we get mm -hmm. more um, details. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that cool. Any other comments? So, how, Mr. Chair, just a, a quick question for clarification purposes. How would we do that statement? Would we draft something and then bring it before our next meeting, a resolution to? I think, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because we're, we're talking February, correct? We're talking January. January? But we, yeah. if we're going to do something with our delegation, we should start talking to them right now. So got to get it going, yeah. We should have that. Okay. All right. Um, um, we have the reading material that's inside, the, that's inside your computer and stuff like that. No more paper. Thank oh, wait, Mr. Chair, I did have one other announcement. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was um, at the uh, St. Elizabeth's Shelter fundraiser, and there were four restaurant groups and the Santa Fe Community College culinary um, students and our staff were there, and we won first place for entrees with this great mashed potatoes and pork loin stuffed with I don't know what all but it was um, really great for were they gluten-free <laughs> no that one wasn't <laughs> but the team I was working on was gluten-free it cool. wasn't the community college but, but you didn't win no we okay. won for appetizers but the community college won for oh, entrees and that's they were really good, good so. oh great Um, um, I remember uh, last year we did a I, I did a, a fundraiser that was that included the culinary group from IAIA, and so once again I'd like to encourage 
if we can, you know, uh, get our culinary group to, to somehow partner with the Native American group at IAIA and even more, um, because I think that just, that just reminded me. I spoke to one of their students and I said, how many times have you been to the community college? And he said, not once. And he said, we'd like to go there. We'd want, we want to know more about it. So whoever is, is the person uh, that, would, that would be in touch with them or, or we need, they're, they're just right there. They're just, they're our neighbors. And I think that, uh, that not just to have them on paper and say that they're part of HEC or, I mean, invite them over to student government and to, and to if there's any activities and stuff like that, just try and get more things happening. I think it's, I think it's critical. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have the reading material, and now uh, we need a motion to go into closed session. I move that we go into closed session for the purposes of discussing potential litigation and limited personnel matters. Second. Second. All those in favor? And what we'll probably do is we'll probably adjourn from there, correct? Because that's the last thing, so, you know, unless any of you diehards want to wait. <laughs>